right view comes in many levels. There's mundane right view, which deals mainly with action and the results of action, the principle of rebirth, and conviction that there are people who know these things from direct knowledge. It's not just a theory. Then there's transcendent right view, which deals more with events in the mind, suffering, its cause, the end of suffering and the path to its end. And many of us make the mistake of wanting to go straight to the transcendent level, who wants to muck around in the mundane, especially when you hear that there are a theory about two levels of truth. There's just conventional truth and then there's the real thing. So it's to stick around with conventions. But then Buddha never taught that way, and he would lead people into transcendent right view by starting with mundane right view. It provides the context for understanding our practice, every stage of the practice. Because some of those principles have an impact on really basic emotions, basic things in the practice. And if you can't get the basic things right, things are going to get skewed by the time you get to the end. Like the issue of forgiveness. Forgiveness seems to be such a basic human activity that we forget that our ideas about forgiveness are picked up from our culture and our view of what's going on in the world. And if you want forgiveness to be an actual helpful part of the practice, you have to look at how your ideas of forgiveness are tied up with your views about the world. Many of us in the West have a feeling that we've picked up from the culture that there's a plan for everything. The universe had a beginning point, it's going to have an end point, there's a story, and it's going to come to closure. Now, there are different ideas about what exactly that story is and the principles of the author. But just the idea that there is that beginning point and there's an end point, that there's a purpose to the universe at large, that right there has a big impact on how we think about forgiveness. If there's a beginning point, you can tally up. Who did what first? How many times you've been wronged? How many times you've wronged the other person? Who owes a debt of forgiveness to the other person? And if the plan for all of this is that we're going to become one loving community, it requires that we get back on good terms with everybody else, especially if there's it's going to be divided into two communities, the people who are on loving terms and the people who are not on loving terms for eternity. Everyone would want to be on the loving term side, which is why we believe that forgiveness has to involve learning how to love the person you forgave. And then there's another view about the plan for all of this is, what, is that each person has his or her own independent inspiration from within, and that we're not in any position to judge anybody else. And in a universe like that, then forgiveness is inappropriate. How can we judge someone else's behavior? Who are you to des decide that you have to, or you're in a position to forgive somebody else? We see that not only in Western culture, but also in the Mahayana. Several years back, a scholar who was working on an early Mahayana text got in touch with me and wanted to know where the principle of not judging anybody else 
appeared in the Pali Canon, because apparently it's all over the Mahayana. The idea that each bodhisattva has his or her own independent inspiration or his or her own, her own path to follow. And I looked around and couldn't find it. There's a lot about judging people in the Pali Canon, what principles you should use, what principles you shouldn't use. But the idea that you're in no position to judge anybody else does not appear in the Buddha's teachings. In other words, you can judge when you've been wronged. Now you may have some misperceptions about the other person's intentions or about the actual long-term impact of the actions. But there are times when you know and you've been wronged. So what are you going to do about it? We'll look at it in terms of the, the Buddha's mundane right view. He says there is no conceivable beginning for this process of wandering on, or he says it comes from an inconceivable beginning. There's no way to make sense of it. He never comes down for sure on whether there was a beginning point or there was not a beginning point, but you just can't conceive it. It's too far back. And as for the end point, again, he doesn't make any statements about whether there's going to be an end point to all this. But his pictures of how the universe goes through its cycles is pretty random. You get a lot of people improvising. There's no big plan. There's no one narrative about all of this. Which means that if you stop to ask yourself that question, well, who was the first person to do wrong? You or the other person? You don't really know. There's that story of Sumdet Do that I told this evening. Sumdet Do was a famous monk in the 19th century Thailand. He was abbot of a monastery right across the river from the palace. One evening a young monk came in to complain about how another monk had hit him. And Sumdet Do's response was, well, you hit him first. And the young monk said, no, he came up and hit me just out of nowhere. I didn't do anything to him. And Sumdito kept saying, no, you hit him first. The young monk got really frustrated, and he went to a monk higher up in the hierarchy. And Sumdito had to explain himself. He said, well, it must have been in some previous lifetime. The complaining monk hit the other monk first. Of course, that might not have been the first time. It could have been a long back and forth. So it's an inconceivable beginning, and there's no, no real closure. Different people decide they'd, they've had enough of the wandering, and they've figured out a way how to stop, but that doesn't keep the universe from continuing to roll on, and other beings to roll on. And again, there's no real plan, as one of the chants we do in the evening says. There's no one in charge, so there's no overall narrative. What there is, though, is the question of what kind of karma do you want to create? And if the answer is skillful karma, then one of the things you've got to learn how to do is not to get focused on how you've been wronged by other people. You don't want to go around getting revenge, because that just keeps the, the bad karmic cycle going on and on and on. So this is what forgiveness means in the context of mundane right view, is that you decide that you're not going to hold any danger to that person. You're not going to try to get, get back at the other person. Let the issue go. Whatever unskillfulness has been going on between the two of you, you want it to stop. And it has to stop with you. That's it. doesn't mean you have to love the person or go and kiss and make up or anything. Because there are some cases where the way you've been wronged is so heavy that it's really hard even to be around the other person much less interact. So you're not called on to love the person, and there's no forcing of the issue that you have to come to closure, that you have to continue weaving the relationship. You can just leave the frayed ends where they were, and that's it. Now, if you want, you can go for reconciliation, but that requires the other person's cooperation as well. In other words, both of you have to see that the relationship is worth continuing.
but there's no sense that every wrong has to be reconciled. Because there are lots of cases where reconciliation really is impossible. One side just doesn't want it. Or one side will not admit to having done wrong. And you see this even in the Venia. The Buddha places a heavy emphasis on harmony within the Sangha, but he never talks about trying to achieve harmony at the expense of the Dharma. In other words, where someone is advocating a position that really is against the Dharma, then you can't get the person to change his, or his mind, then that's it. The Sangha expels the person, or if it's two groups of people, one of them will just leave. Because you figure out the other, the other side's motivation is just too corrupt. In a case like that, the Buddha says you cannot re achieve reconciliation, you cannot achieve harmony. And to try to force harmony by pretending that there's no difference or it's both sides are okay is against the Vinaya, it's against the Dharma. So again, there's no master plan that everything is going to have to get resolved in the end. It's up to you to decide exactly where you want to take this relationship. Now, it's for your own good to give forgiveness, and forgiveness is something you can give from one side, regardless of whether the other person accepts your forgiveness or even thinks that he or she did something wrong. But for the sake of your own training of the mind, for the sake of gaining freedom, you have to forgive. You don't want to pose a danger in anybody. You don't want to get back. And as for being forgiven, you have to accept there are times when people will not forgive you for something you've done. And that doesn't mean what you did was so awful that nobody could forgive you. It's Again, it's a kind of a personal choice. As the Buddha once said, there are two kinds of fools. One is the fool who never admits having done wrong, and the other is the one who, when presented with an apology, refuses to accept it, or presented with a righteous apology, a sincere apology, refuses to accept it. Now, a sincere apology means not only that you really are sorry, but you really are going to Try not to do that again in the future, whatever it was. Some people are wise and they'll accept that kind of apology. Other people are foolish. And you can't make your happiness depend on trying to get them to forgive you, overcome their foolishness. So keep that phrase in the back of your mind. There's no one in charge. There's no overall narrative that says everything has to be tied up into nice, neat packages. Not every story has to come to closure. Think of it more as an author just kind of tossing out story ideas, and the story gets to a point where it's really not a good story, it's not going to go anywhere, you just throw the story away. Start a new story. This is one of the advantages of mundane right view, is it allows you to start new stories all the time. Start a story in which you learn how to develop skillful qualities, and however bad your upbringing or however bad you've been behaving in the past, or however poorly you've been treated in the past, you overcame the difficulties. You took charge of your life. You realized that whatever happiness was going to be true and lasting was going to have to come from training the mind. giving up any desire to settle old scores, to go around loving everybody or being loved by everybody. You give those attitudes up. Now, you do develop goodwill. Goodwill is not loving kindness. Goodwill is the desire that all beings be happy. Now, in some cases, 
that happiness can be found by continuing a relationship. In other cases, you have to say, well, that's it as far as this relationship goes, but may you be happy wherever you go. Like that chant the Buddha has for wishing goodwill for snakes and scorpions and rats and creepy things. So, may all beings be happy, whether they have no legs or two legs or four legs or many legs. And then, may they meet with good fortune, and may they now go away. There's some cases where a continued relationship is not going to be a good thing for either side. Like the story with the John Fuang with a snake in his room. The snake moved in, and whether it's during the day or the night, and he realized he had a snake in the room, but he decided to take it as a test. So he continued with living with the snake in his room for three days to see how much fear he might have. And if he really could spread goodwill to snakes, and he was spreading goodwill to the snake all the time. And finally, on the third night, he sat and meditated and in his mind addressed a message to the snake, which is basically, you know, we come from different branches of the animal kingdom, just like people from different societies. Our language is different, our attitudes, our backgrounds are different. It's very easy to misunderstand each other. I might do something that you would take offense at. be much better if you went someplace else. There are many nice places out there in the forest. And the snake left. I remember one of those passages in the phrase for goodwill is, may all living beings look after themselves with ease. It's not that you're going to go around and look after everybody else and clean up after them and take care of them and try to please them and always close, intimate relationship with them. There's some beings, some people, where it's really hard and it's too much to ask. You want to focus instead on your own mind, making sure you have no ill will for anybody. And at the very least, you're harmless in your behavior. And when you understand forgiveness in this way, then the practice of forgiveness is a lot easier. And it's more conducive to becoming free. <laughs>